Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so uh, this is going to be somewhat a strangely ordered talk. So usually the talk would start by giving some big picture and then going into some details. So I'm going to first go into details and then I'll give a big picture. Right? So, um, so if you're tempted to doze off, you should do that right away. <laughs> and then <laughs> when I get to the big picture, that's the time to wake up. Right? Uh, okay, so before I go into the details, I just want to go over some notation. Uh, it's all fairly standard, so it's it's all well known. Although maybe it's <coughs> uh, standard in different con in different contexts, and I'll, I'll use things from different contexts here. Uh, so first, f alpha. That's a set of increasing sequences from f. Uh, that's usually used when f is an ordinal, and then increasing means just in the usual order on ordinals. I'm going to use it just for any f and the elements of f I'll just ask them to be increasing in the subset relation. Okay, So I just mean the set of all sequences of length alpha so that uh, if xi is less than zeta then x xi is a subset of x zeta. Right? So just increasing in inclusion. The x xi's are members of script f? Uh, yes, members of script f. Yep. Uh, and then what I'll call f alpha the ap approachable, these are the approachable sequences, right? So again, increasing, but I want to ask a bit more now. I want to ask that the sequence up to xi is an element of x xi. Okay? And this is the same as approachability that's studied in countable and uncountable structures, right? So increasing sequences of elements of f uh, with the x zeta zeta less than xi, always an element of x xi. Uh, then a two coloring that should be f square brackets to the alpha. <coughs> so a two coloring is just a function from that into zero one. Okay, it's perfectly standard. Uh, and then h is homogeneous if uh, let's let me just say zero homogeneous. That's all I'll need if um, it take if chi takes value zero on all sequences from h. Right. So again, the standard notation. And now something slightly less standard. So I'll say that H is zero homogeneous for chi on approachable sequences if chi takes value zero on approachable sequences from X. Right? So the, the natural thing. Um, and then you can define the same thing with superscript less than alpha. And then what I mean is sequences of le length less than alpha instead of length alpha. And typically, I'm going to use it with f, the collection of countable subsets of some x. Right? So I'll have some underlying set x, and my f will just be all countable subsets of x. Right? So it will be here increasing countable subsets of x, right? and, and uh, approachable sequences of countable subsets from x. Um, and then the other thing is that I'm going to look for an h that's a club when I want to talk about homogeneous or zero homogeneous sets. Uh, so let me just quickly define what I mean by club. So H is club in the collection of countable subsets of X if there is some function little h so that uh, any countable set that's so that the elements of X are exactly the countable sets which are closed under little h, right? So this is all that this is saying here, that X is in, in the club H if and only if, well, you take this function H and apply it to all tuples from X you stay inside x, right? So x is closed under this function. Uh, and then just a little more generally, I'm going to say that h is club on R. Well, if the same thing holds, but modulo the fact that x has to belong to R. Okay, so then uh, there exists this little h so that for every x in R, x is in h if and only if it's closed under h to the extent possible. Right, so you take the image under H of tuples from X. If anything takes you outside the union of R, then it has no chance of being in X, right? And so forget about this. But the ones that stay inside the union of R, you want them in X. Right? Um, and then just standard terminology. I'll say that phi of X holds for a club of X in R 
to mean that there exists a club on R so that phi of x holds for all x in that club. Okay, so it's, it's all fairly standard, except perhaps talking about the approachable sequences in the context of homogeneity. Uh, okay. Well, I guess I should have said uh, I'm willing to go slowly, so that if there are any questions, just ask. Um, I'm not sure how that will go with the videotaping. But still. Okay. Uh, so now, countable reflection of clubs. So this is a statement. So this is countable reflection of clubs for a set X. So it says that for every two coloring chi on the countable subsets of X, uh, on countable sequences of countable subsets of X, if you have a club of U of size Aleph 1, so that for that U there is a club of countable subsets of U, which is zero homogeneous for chi, then there is a club of countable subsets of X, which is zero homogeneous for chi, uh, on approachable sequences, both of them. Uh, so, at first glance, this might look like a tautology, <laughs> okay? Uh, the conclusion gives you a club uh, of countable objects, so a club of countable sets, which is zero homogeneous for chi on approachable sequences. The hypothesis asks for a club of countable sets, which is zero homogeneous uh, for chi on approachable sequences. Uh, but those two are not the same, right? The difference is the uniformity of the conclusion, right? The conclusion gives you this one club that will work just overall on X, right? So it's this one club of countable subsets of X, and it gives you homogeneity just overall on X, right? The hypothesis tells you that there are a lot of little clubs, right? If you take any uncountable U, there will be a club of countable objects that works on U, right? But these might be different. If you take U1 and U2 and they're different, there might be different uh, one club for, that works for U1, another one that works for U2. And if you take a sequence that combines elements from both of them, chi might give you value 1, right? So, so the strength in the conclusion here is the uniformity. You get this one club that will work just overall on X. Uh, and I'll, I'll show an application in, in a minute that exactly uses this uniformity. <coughs> Sorry? It's unreadable. <laughs> it's... Uh, yes, it's for sequences, yeah. And there is exactly an element of reflection here. Because um, if you think about it from the point of view of a U, which is very elementary, Right, then the hypothesis tells you that there is this external club, external club on U, and U is just something of size Aleph 1, right? So there is this external club on U which is zero homogeneous, that's the hypothesis, and then the conclusion is that you can get a club on X which is zero homogeneous, and if U is sufficiently elementary, you'd be able to get that inside U, for example. Uh, no. Yeah, but the sequences have to be approachable. So if U is not approachable, there probably won't be that many sequences, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and I do require the hypothesis for all, for a club of U, right? So for a club of U, there is a club on U which is zero homogeneous, then there is overall a club which is zero homogeneous. Is that okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, and then one quick comment, I'm not really going, at least initially, I won't use the strength on sequence of just all countable sequences. I'm going to fix some length and just use the statement for a particular length alpha. But of course, this statement subsumes all the statements for fixed length, for fixed countable length alpha. <coughs> okay, uh, so let's start by saying that this is very far from a tautology. Uh, so if you have countable reflection of clubs, then you get failure of square, right? So in particular, this countable reflection of clubs has very strong large cardinal uh, strength. Okay. Uh, so let's prove that. So suppose you have a square sequence, C alpha. Uh, uh, every countable subset of X, yes, yeah. Every countable subset of X belongs to X. So X to the alpha zero belongs to X. Yeah. Um, so for example, H kappa plus, 
Uh, so all hereditary, all sets of hereditary cardinality up to kappa plus. But, but it doesn't have to be that, just countably close is enough. Um, okay, uh, so suppose you have a square sequence, a square kappa sequence C alpha, and I'll just take the natural coloring, and it's just going to be a coloring on sequences of length two. I'm not going to need any large alpha, just alpha equals to two. So you take two sets X and Y, uh, let's say the soup of x intersection kappa plus is alpha, the soup of y intersection kappa plus is beta, and then color the pair x, y with zero if alpha belongs to the set of limit points of C beta. Right, so it's really the natural coloring you'd expect in the context of square. Okay? So x, y get color zero if uh, alpha belongs to the limit of C beta. Now, by coherence, you do have a lot of small homogeneous sets, right? So by coherence of the score sequence, for every u whose soup intersection with kappa plus has cofinality omega 1, you can find a homogeneous club. Um, right? And that's easy, because you just look, let gamma be the soup, let's say, um, and then just take the club of all x whose, soup intersec whose intersection with kappa plus has soup inside the limit points of C gamma. Right? So then by coherence for any two of these with soup alpha, soups alpha and beta, alpha belongs to, alpha is a limit point of C beta. Right? So this is just coherence. Uh, and that gives you a lot of s homogeneous clubs for u of size alpha 1. Right? And this is exactly the hypothesis of countable reflection of clubs. Right, that you have all these small homogeneous clubs for this coloring. Um, so then using countable reflection of clubs, you have a club now over all on X, which again is zero homogeneous for chi. Okay, so this is a club on the full X, which is zero homogeneous for chi. And then you take the set of soups of X intersection kappa plus for X in this club on X, uh, and this gives you a thread through the square sequence, again, using coherence. Because if you take, I'll, I'll write this down, so if you take any x, y in h, and you want, say, with soups alpha, beta, right, and you want to show that alpha is a limit point of C beta, so what you do is you take some z, which is greater than both of them, right, has them both as elements, and then you can use the chi, you can use the, the coloring on xz and on yz, right? Because these are approachable sequences now, because z, x belongs to z and y belongs to z. So you use the coloring on xz and yz, you get that it's zero in both cases. So each of them is a limit point of the square sequence corresponding to the soup of z, and then by coherence they're each in the, uh, in the square sequence of the other. Or the larger one, the smaller one is in the square sequence of the larger one, right? And this is where I used the countable closure. This is one place where I use it. There is another one. Right? Yes. Just something. Yeah. So I need to be able to take an approachable sequence. So I cannot use the coloring on the pair x y, right? So I need to find some z which has both of them as elements. Right? Yeah, that's all. Uh, Z is another subset of, of X, right? So these are all subsets of X. Um, okay. uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, so countable reflection of clubs contradicts square kappa, and in particular it has very strong large cardinal strength. Okay. Uh, now, this wouldn't be interesting if it weren't consistent, right? The talk would end here. Uh, so let me show that it is consistent. And of course, you sort of know what you'd need to prove the consistency. It contradicts square, so your first guess is super compact, right? Uh, so theorem, suppose kappa is super compact. Let G be generic, just for the most natural forcing in this context, just collapse everything less than kappa to be alpha 1. Okay, so kappa becomes alpha 2 in the extension then in the extension you have countable reflection of clubs for every x. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to prove this. So let's fix x and fix the coloring chi, and suppose they satisfy the assumption of countable reflection of clubs. And 
Remember that means that for a club of u of size alpha of one, you can find a club in u which is zero homogeneous for chi on approachable sequences. Yeah. What we need then is a club H overall on X, which is zero homogeneous for chi on approachable sequences. Yeah. Uh, and the idea, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass to a generic alter power where the image of X has size aleph one, right? If you take just the most natural generic alter power in this case, using a super compactness measure on kappa, and look at the pointwise image of X, this will have size aleph one in the extension, right? So then you can use the assumption of countable reflection on cl of clubs on the pointwise image of X, because it has size aleph one. And this will give you, in the extension, a club in the pointwise, in the pointwise image of X, which is zero homogeneous, right? Um, zero homogeneous for the image of chi, right? Uh, so this is this thing, and then what I want to do is I want to now go back to V and find in V some club so that all its elements I can somehow arrange that they get into elements of this generic club on the pointwise image of X. Okay, so this is the idea of the proof, and let me actually do that. So let's say that X is X dot G, chi is chi dot G. Uh, let's take a super compactness measure mu, and the, at least the cardinality of X super compactness, and let's take some much larger regular cardinal theta uh, and try to realize this idea, okay? Uh, so the first thing is this lemma, because remember I have to be able to somehow in already in V predict what will be the clubs on the pointwise image of X in the extension. So the first thing is this lemma that says that there is a club in V on countable subsets of X, right? So that, uh, let's for a minute ignore the statement of the lemma and think about the simplest thing when the sequence just has length one, okay? So I want a club, a club of subsets of X so that every little X in that club extends to an elementary substructure of H theta, um, right? So I want, if you just think of a sequence of length one, oh, okay. Um, so what I want is, I want a club of X such that, um, and so I want a club of X with this property. So just that every little X in the club extends to a Z which is elementary in H theta and its intersection with X is little X. And this, of course, is clear, right? You just need your little x to be closed enough so that when you extend to an elementary substructure, you don't, you don't add anything inside x, right? So that's clear. The lemma is exactly the same statement for approachable sequences, right? So you have this club so that if you take any approachable sequence from the, se from the club h, then each element of the sequence, each x psi, extends to an elementary substructure z xi, whose intersection with x is exactly x xi. And the one extra ingredient is that I want the sequence of the z xi's to also be approachable. And that's not hard to arrange, okay? So I, I won't prove the lemma, but, but it's not hard to arrange. And it's essentially similar to this argument. Just a very simple closure argument. Okay, uh, so let's, assuming the lemma, uh, now I'm going to prove that h is zero homogeneous for chi. And remember what was the idea? The idea was to show that any approachable sequence for, from X, I can realize its image as a, an approachable sequence in this club witnessing homogeneity for the pointwise image of X. Right? That was the idea. Okay, so let's do that. So fix some sequence X approachable from H. Let Z be as in the lemma. So Z are the elementary extension. Each Z Xi is an extension of X Xi and it's elementary in H theta. Now let's create this generic, this generic elementary embedding. So start with the super compactness embedding from V to V star, just the order power by the super compactness measure. Now to extend that to the e generic extension VG, we need to do a little bit more forcing. Right? And this is a standard argument. So let F be generic for the collapse uh, of everything between kappa and the image of kappa. Right? Everything between the critical point and its image uh, over VG. So then in the extra extension VGF, pi extends to an elementary embedding pi star from VG to V star G. 
composed with f. Right? This is completely standard. Uh, now let's take the pointwise image of x. Okay, so u is a pointwise image of x. Uh, it has size aleph 1. It belongs to v star g composed with f and has size aleph 1 there. And what we want to do is we want to use the hypothesis of countable reflection of clubs on this u to get a club in u which is zero homogeneous. And then we want to argue that this sequence is, this sequence is mapped exactly into this club. And then kitex, the image of kitex value zero on the image of this sequence. Okay, that's what we plan to do. Uh, so le let's look at what will happen, what will be the image of this sequence, the image of the, z of the x size. Uh, but first I want to make sure the generic that I have, this f, is nice enough. So I know that the z's are all elementary in h theta, and they're also approachable, right? So each one belongs to the next one, and in fact at each stage the whole sequence up to it belongs, the whole sequence up to zxi belongs to zxi. Right? So from this and the countable closure of this forcing to add f, you can build master conditions for all these zxi's, right? Just you go over them one by one, each is countable, so using the countable closure you build a master condition for it. And then using the approachability you can ensure that the master condition you build is always inside the next model. Okay, so you can get a descending sequence of conditions in this forcing f, right, this extra forcing f, uh, each of them a master condition for one of the z's and, and they're descending. Okay. okay. Uh, so then without loss of generality changing f, if I need to, I might as well assume that the lower bound for this descending sequence is an element of f, right? And then what I get is that the extension of h z psi by f is elementary in the extension of h theta g by f, right? Because z psi was elementary in h theta g, and I put a master condition for z psi into f, right? So I get this elementarity. And also, I get that the intersection of zxi f with h theta g is exactly zxi. Again, just a master condition, right? Uh, is that okay so far? Uh, okay. So now let's look at zxi f intersection u. And remember, u is a pointwise image of x, right? So this is zxi f intersection with a pointwise image of x. And I want to figure out what y psi is. So suppose you have something in y psi. Okay? So it's an element of z psi f. It's also an element of the pointwise image of x, of capital X. Right? So it has a pre-image, and that pre-image belongs to capital X. Right? Now by elementarity of z psi f, you can figure out what this pre-image is inside z psi f. Right? Just by elementarity, you have the pre-image in there. So in fact, you have a pre-image in zxi f, right, also in x, so in zxi f intersection x, and therefore in zxi intersection x, because zxi f is just intersection with h theta is just zxi, so the preimage is in zxi intersection x, and zxi intersection x was x xi, right? So, so in fact, for anything in here, you have an image inside x, a preimage in x xi. Okay, so anything in here is the image of something in x psi. The other direction is also true by a similar argument. So y psi is exactly the pointwise image of x psi. Okay? And it's basically just using the elementarity of z psi f. Okay? Now what is the pointwise image of x psi? Remember x psi is countable, so its pointwise image is, is just its image, right? So just pi star of x psi. So y psi is equal to pi star of x psi. And that's, and that's great because remember our, our goal was to argue about what happens when you move x psi by pi star, right? To show that then chi, pi star of chi takes val, value zero, right? So now we know exactly what the images are, it's y psi. So, so what's left is just to show that chi takes, pi star of chi takes value zero on the y psi. Uh, so let's do that. So we know that y psi is pi star of x psi. Now the x psi gave you were an approachable sequence, right? So in particular now you get that the y size give you an approachable sequence. Now this countable reflection of clubs, the hypothesis was that on u we have a club which is zero homogeneous, right? So let's take that club. 
So in the extension in V star GF, we have this club C on countable subsets of U, which is zero homogeneous for the image of chi on approachable sequences. By elementarity, you can get this club inside Z0F. Right? Remember, Z0F was already elementary with everything in it, everything we cared about in it. So we can find this club already in Z0F. In other words, we can find this function which defines the club. So the club is just everything closed under this function, and we can find the function inside Z0F. Right? But that means that Z0F, and in fact, every Z xi f is closed under this function. So that means that all the y size belong to C, right? Because the y size were exactly the intersection of Z xi f with u. And this g is from u to the lesson omega into u, so they're all closed. The Z xi f's are all closed, so hence the y size are all closed. So, uh, sorry, this should be just the y size, not their pi star image, right? So the y size, oh, sorry, this should be chi. So pi star of chi applied to this sequence, right? That's zero. Because pi star of chi is zero homogeneous on this C, and we just show that this sequence of Ys is inside C, right? So pi star of chi applied to the sequence is zero, and hence that should also be chi. So chi of X xi is zero. And this is it, right? So that proves the theorem. So we have our zero homogeneous club on X. Uh, any questions? So let, let me <coughs> just put one quick observation. I didn't really need that much to know that much about the forcing. I mean, if you look at the proof, what did we use about the forcing, the initial forcing, the collapse to alif one of everything less than kappa? All we use is that if you take the point, that if you take the image of, well, so we use it, you can get this elementary, this extension of the elementary embedding, right? So for that, you need that the pointwise image of the forcing embeds into the image of the forcing, right? So we use this thing, pi image of Q embeds into pi of Q, just to be able to extend the embedding. And the other thing we use is that the quotient forcing between pi of Q and the pointwise image of Q, we use that that was countably closed to construct these master conditions. Right? So this is really all we needed, just that pi image of Q embeds directly into pi of q, and that the quotient is countably closed. And just under these assumptions, the proof would go through. Uh, okay, <coughs> so this is countable reflection of clubs. Now, let me talk a little bit about something different, and I'll, I'll call it sparse sets. Right? Uh, so I'm going to fix a few things, just that will be fixed throughout. So one is this map psi. And it's just giving you a lot of enumerations. So what Psi does is, is to every x in its domain, it's giving you a bijection from omega 1 into x, onto x. Right? So the domain should consist only on th of things of size alpha 1, of course. And then Psi of x would be a bijection from omega 1 onto x. Okay? Uh, and then let's fix some increasing sequence. And now I mean that it's increasing both in membership and inclusion relations. Okay? Uh, and let's take x to be the union of this sequence. So I want to say that, and let's take some club, sorry? Uh, yes, that's right, yeah. I want them all of size out of one, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so now let's take some clubs in, in omega one, and let's define m to be sparse at alpha relative to c, if, the following holds for m alpha, right? So first I want m alpha in the domain. So, and then I want to know that for all large enough successive elements of C, so you take some new in C and you take its successor in C new prime. Then I want to look at psi m alpha. Remember this is a bijection from omega one onto m alpha, right? So I want to look at the image of this interval, an interval from a point in C up to its successor in C. So the image of that interval under the bijection, so this is giving you, of course, a lot of elements of m alpha, right? And I want to say that there is at most one of them, which is one of the m size, okay? So what, what you have here is you've divided m alpha into segments, right? You have the image of everything up to new, the image of everything up to new prime, the image up to the, uh, of everything up to the next element of C and so on. 
So that's giving you countable sets increasing in M alpha. And I want to show that eventually, oops. <laughs> so I want to show that eventually in each of them you add just one more of the M's, right? So this sequence really is very sparse, right? Because as C becomes a thinner and thinner clubs, these will grow faster and faster, right? I mean, you'll add more and more elements of M alpha every time you pass to the next new in C, right? And nonetheless, eventually, in each step passing to the next element in the club, you will add just one more of the M size. Okay, so the M size show up very sparsely below M alpha. Uh, and then M is sparse relative to a family F if it's sparse at each alpha relative to every club in F. Okay? So, so for each C in F, you have this, that M adds elements, you add elements to the sequence, to the sequence M size very slowly. Right? At most one, m one new one every time you go to the next element of the club C. Uh, okay. So one thing you get out of this in particular is fast clubs on omega-1. So let me just define a fast club out of a sparse sequence. So let's look at exactly the places where you get new elements of the M sequence, right? So remember, psi of M alpha is a bijection from omega-1 onto M alpha. So look at those iotas so that this bijection would land you inside the sequence. It will give you one of the new psi's. Right? So sparse, and let's call this I alpha, the set of these iotas where you get an element of the M sequence. Right? So sparseness is telling you that th these points in I alpha come very slowly. Right? If you take your club C, between any two successive points of C, there will be at most one element of I alpha. Right? So or another way to say it is that between any points of I alpha, there will be at least one element of C. So that means that the limit points of I alpha are eventually contained in C. Right? Uh, so the limit points of I alpha, this set is a fast club relative to C. Right? And if your family here had plenty of club C, then this I alpha, its limit points would be fast relative to every club in F. Right? So you get a fast club out of this. Uh, so that's one thing I want to note. And then the other I phrase this using clubs on omega-1, but of course the first thing I did here really is translate them to clubs on M alpha, right? So to increasing continuous sequences of countable subsets of M alpha, right? I moved from a new in C to the image of new under psi of M alpha, right? So I could have phrased everything directly just using clubs in M alpha, right? So an alternative formulation is if you have this increasing continuous sequence whose union is M alpha, then what sparseness is telling you that eventually in every new step of the C sequence, right, in C delta plus one minus C delta, you get at most one new element of the M sequence, right? So this is sparseness. Uh, okay, uh, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when psi is fixed and it's just a translation between clubs in M alpha and clubs in omega one, right? Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, so these are sparse sets. Uh, and the thing I want to do, of course, is force to add a sparse set, <laughs> right? It's not completely clear why yet, but in a couple of slides it will be. So I, I want to force to add a sparse set, and I want to do it using countable conditions. So what I'm going to write next is just the most natural forcing notion to add a sparse set using countable approximations. Uh, now, I'm going, I want a sparse set in X, right? So I want really these M alphas that are subsets of X. But let me go a little bit beyond X. Let me go to some H theta, which is beyond X. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to force with M, which are subsets of H theta, right? So I'm going to add a sequence of subsets of H theta, but then I'm going to restrict to X. So given S, which is a sequence of subsets of H theta, S restricted to X this way is just M intersection X for M in S. So these are subsets of X. Right? Now what's the most natural forcing to add a sparse sequence? Well, it's this, <laughs> okay? Uh, so it has several clauses, but just when you read, remember that it's the most natural forcing to add a sparse set using countable approximations. 
So these S's are the countable approximations, right? So these are countable increasing sequences from H theta, but then I will look at the restriction to X. So this will give me countable increasing sequences of subsets of X, right? Now, I need to ensure sparseness. So I have to make sure that I don't put too many new elements into the sequence. Right? And too many new is measured by these clubs, right? Eventually, I have to make sure the sequence is sparse relative to each club. So this script C is just the collection of clubs that I've, that I've already committed to handling, right? So it's a countable collection of clubs. And then the ordering S increases, C increases, and this is a sparseness condition. If you already put C in your family, so you're already committed to maintaining sparseness relative to C, then you have to make sure that between two successive points of C, you don't add more than one new element to your sequence. Right? And this is exactly this con condition. So you have two successive points in C, and you have some M that's already in S. So then in M, right, so M intersection X, between new and new prime, you did not add more than one new element. Right? This is what this condition is saying. So if you look at the new elements you put in, so S star minus S, inside this interval. If you did put some new element in, then overall you should have just one element, no more. Right? So it's exactly what you need to ensure sparseness. Okay? So is this okay? Any questions? Okay, so it's just the most natural forcing to add a sparse set by countable approximations. Uh, yes, and relative to Psi, yes, yep, in, in the ground model. Yep. Okay, now uh, I would like to say that this forcing is well behaved. Okay, now if I dropped these conditions that ensured sparseness, right? If I forgot about these clubs that I'm committed to and forgot about the sparseness condition, what I would have is just forcing with countable sequences, increasing countable sequences. And that's a proper, an Aleph 1 proper forcing. In fact, it would be even strongly Aleph 1 proper you would have this strong properness property that if you have some Q in S and you have any T which is between the intersection of S and Q and Q, then S and T are compatible. Right? So you have your sequence S, you have any Q in it, and you can squeeze anything you want in between and the union will still be increasing, and then it's a condition. Right? And that gives you properness, in fact, strong properness. If I were to drop this sparseness condition, of course, the sparseness condition is essential to adding a sparse set, right? So I cannot drop it. Uh, and with this condition, it's not even clear that the poset is Aleph 1 proper, let alone strongly proper. Because you cannot just put any T that you, can, that you want to squeeze between Q and what happens below Q. You cannot just add any such T to your condition. Whatever you add has to satisfy the sparseness condition, right? So it has to be very sparse relative to the clubs you already have in and relative to this Q, right? So you cannot just put anything in, it will destroy the sparseness. So why do we need to preserve the sparseness? Right? So let, let me concentrate on that. So let, let's work in this situation. We have this T. We have this S bar, which is an initial segment of T, right? Think of S bar as S intersection Q, and T is some extension of that, right? So then let's say that the spacing sequence for T at this initial seg segment S bar is an approachable sequence of X's which separates the new points of T, right? So separates the points of T above S bar. Uh, and what this means is that the first element of the sequence X0 already contains S bar up to X. The last element contains, sorry, contain S, contains S bar, but remember I keep restricting to this X, right? The last element of the sequence all contains T, and in between, every time you move from an X Xi to an X Xi plus one, you get at most one element of the sequence, or let's even say exactly one element of the sequence, okay? So this is exactly what you need for sparseness if this sequence belongs to all the clubs that you're already committed to, right? So if the X Xi's are already, so if in all the clubs that you're committed to, this will exactly give you that T union S satisfies the sparseness condition. You add just one new element between successive points of the club. Right? 
Um, and this is this proposition. So suppose you have this condition, SC, you have Q and S, then there is this club in Q, so that any condition T which satisfies the assumptions I had before, so T and extends S intersection Q, T is contained in Q, right? So these are the assumptions that normally would let you just add T and still get a linear sequence. And now the extra assumption, there is a spacing sequence with all its elements in C star, this club of countable subsets of Q. Okay, so if for every C star you can do that, then the two conditions are compatible. Right? Uh, because you can pick your C star to be, remember this, if I go back to this sparseness condition, this thing, that's telling you that you have to put new elements very carefully, right? No more than one between any two successive points of the club here, right? So you have only countably many clubs, take all of them, or take each of them, move it to a club in M alpha using Psi, right? or a club in Q using Psi. Right? Then you have countably many clubs in, in Q. Then take their intersection, and this is the C star that you're going to use here, right? The intersection of all the clubs you're committed to. And then the spacing sequence will tell you that between any points in that club, you added at most one element, right? So you get exactly the sparseness condition. So this is exactly the hypothesis you need to make sure that T and S are compatible mod with the sparseness condition. Okay. Now, what do I need to get properness? What I need is I need some condition as in the proposition, right, so that it will be compatible with S, which satisfies some given property phi that S satisfies. For example, membership in some dense set. Or if I want to show that SC is a master condition, I have some dense set. I might as well assume that SC belongs to it. I need to get a TD which belongs to the dense set, right? Satisfy the same property. And I need it to be compatible with SC. And for that, I need the assumptions of the proposition. So I need it to have this separating sequence. Right? And then I get properness. Uh, and this can be done using countable reflection of clubs. Because, I mean, and countable reflection of clubs is exactly what I need here. So imagine for a moment that I couldn't find this TD, right? So what, what does that mean? It means that whenever you look at some T, uh, which is an end extension of S intersection Q, if it satisfies this property phi, right, then it does not have a spacing sequence, right? Because if you found something that both has a spacing sequence and satisfies phi, you're done. Right? Okay, so look at the set of, so f of these bad T's, right? The T's that, um, so, yeah, I want, yes, so the T's that do have a spacing sequence, right? Because those T's which do have a spacing sequence, they're bad in the sense that they do not satisfy, so do not satisfy phi, right? So look at the set of T which have a spacing sequence. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, the other way around. So you work in Q and you have the dense set in Q. So look in Q at the bad T's, the ones that do not get into the dense set or do not satisfy phi, right? So these are the bad T's. And you know that only these ones will have spacing sequences, right? Only the bad ones. Now use reflection of clubs, right? Suppose you cannot get anyone with any such condition, any such condition in C star for some club C star. Right, so this is giving you a homogeneous set for the coloring that takes the bad, the bad T and gives them color zero. Right, so this is your coloring, just the bad T's, the ones that do not satisfy phi, get color zero. And what you're assuming here that you cannot find something which does satisfy phi and has a spacing sequence. So index club C, right, if you get a spacing sequence which is in this club, it will correspond to, ah, sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit tired, I'm botching this argument completely. <laughs> Look at approachable sequences, right? So call an approachable sequence bad if it does not have, if it is not the spacing sequence of a condition which satisfies phi, okay? So an approachable sequence is bad if it does not have, if it is not the spacing sequence of a condition that satisfies phi. And your assumption here is that you have a club of bad sequences, right? Because anything which, any sequence X with all its elements in C star is not going to be the spacing sequence of a good, co of a condition TD, okay? 
So this, so assuming you cannot get properness, you have this club C star of bad sequences, right? Sequences which are not the spacing sequence of condition satisfying phi. But then by reflection of clubs, you can get such a club already in Q. So inside Q, using reflection of clubs and elementarity, you can get a club so that all sequences from this club are bad. In other words, they are not the spacing sequence of a condition satisfying phi. But if the club is in Q, then you can get the spacing sequence for S inside this club. That's not hard to see because all the elements of S from Q onward are closed under any function in Q. So they, and they're of size omega one. So inside them, you can construct countable sets closed under your favorite function that belongs to Q. Right, so in fact, you can get something in the club. Now, now that you know the club is inside Q, you can get something in the club which has, a, which is a spacing sequence for a condition satisfying phi, namely for S. Okay, so it's not hard. I'm just sort of botching it completely, but it's it's exactly a reflection of clubs that you need to get from this proposition that the forcing is Aleph 1 proper. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me just summarize that. So assuming countable reflection of clubs, the natural posit to add a sparse set by countable approximations is Aleph 1 proper. Okay. Uh, now if countable reflection of clubs is arranged the way we did it from a supercompact, then remember it persists to any nice extension. And nice just meant that you could construct, you could extend em embeddings to the extension and the factor posit is countably closed, right? So in fact, it would persist. After you force to add this sparse set, you would still have countable reflection of clubs. So then what you can do is, of course, force to add another sparse set, right? And you would still have countable reflection of clubs and you can continue this way. And countable reflection of clubs will also let you go through the iterations, provided you used countable supports with side conditions to ensure properness. Okay. And it would be a very similar argument to the properness of the natural posit to add a sparse set. A very similar argument would give you properness of the iteration. So what you end up with is the following theorem. Suppose kappa is super compact, then there is a countably closed forcing extension turning kappa into Aleph 2 and satisfying this thing that I'll call the sparseness axiom, for every family f of size Aleph 2, there is some s which is sparse relative to everything in that family. Okay, you can just keep adding sparse sets and get this universality. You have sparse sets for every f of size Aleph 2. Uh, clubs, clubs in omega 1, right? Uh, so for every family f of size Aleph 2 of clubs in, Aleph in omega 1, uh, but f is of size alpha 2, you get some sparse set with some set which is sparse relative to all of them. It was just added somewhere along your iteration. Okay. Now I use the super compact here, but in fact the weekly compact is enough with a little bit more work. Okay, so now I can take five more minutes. I so now the big picture, <laughs> okay, so the interesting part, the last five minutes. Um, so why add, why bother to add these sparse sets, okay? Well, so this is connected to forcing, uh, to proper forcing. So I mean, there are these key applications of PFA which use fast clubs on omega one, okay? And uh, the typical way you do that, and I'll give some examples in the, in the next slide, but the typical way you use these fast clubs on omega one in connection with PFA is you either construct or force a fast enough club. Sometimes you can just construct it if you don't need that much fastness. Then you define a posit whose conditions, well, first are finite, and then they're separated by elements of C, right? So the condition is structured in such, such a way that between any two points in the condition, you, you separate them with some element of C, right? So you have some element of C so that the lower points point belongs, the lo lower points belong to it and the next point does not. Right? So, um, now if C is fast enough and you had a sequence of Aleph 1 conditions and it was also a delta system, then you know these separating elements as you increase Xi, you move out of any countable set. So these separating elements are eventually, if C is fast enough, they're eventually getting to 
higher and higher in C, and because C is fast, you will get that they're arbitrarily elementary in the union of C. So if C is some club on X, the separating elements become more and more closed inside X because the club is fast. Right? It eventually gets into any club witnessing any level of elementarity. Um, and that you use, of course, it depends a lot on how you construct it P, and this is the really complicated part, but that you use to ensure to argue at the end that P is CCC. It just does not have anti-chains of size aleph 1. Right? So this is the typical way fast clubs are used in connection with PFA. And what you get is that the combined poset, you added the fast club and then did the CCC forcing, is proper. Now, some examples of constructions which use this kind of scheme. And I guess probably the first one is Baumgartner, any two Aleph 1 dense subsets of R are order isomorphic. And the forcing there is once you edit the fast club, you force with finite approximations to the isomorphism, but you make sure that the top element of the approximation is separated by th from the previous ones by an element of the fast club. And that's, that lets you argue that there is no anti-chain of size aleph 1. Another one is the Todorcevich's open coloring axiom. So any open graph G on a separable metric space either is aleph 0 colorable or has a clique of size aleph 1. You force to add the clique and you make sure that the, ele the conditions are finite and you make sure that they're separated by elements of some fast club. And that lets you argue that the end forcing to add the click is CCC if you already had the fast club. It's similar with P, the P ideal dichotomy, although there it's not enough for the club to be fast, you also need it to behave generically in, in some particular way. Uh, and then of course there is a question, do these, these are really important applications of PFA, uh, and you have this question, do they have analogs at Aleph 2, right? So I mean we already have analogs for some applications of Aleph 2 using these three type finite, these three type side conditions that I talked about already several times at Lumini before, right? but they didn't give analogs of these things, right? And the problem was that you didn't have the right notion of a fast club, okay? So that question, do these things have analogs at Aleph 2 remained open? And one thing to note about it, at least with the scheme I mentioned before of some countably closed and then some CCC forcing, you'd expect the end construction to give you, for a higher analog, the end construction should give you something with continuum at least out of three. Because you keep doing these CCC forcings with finite conditions, they keep adding new reals, and you do out of three of them, right? Okay, uh, so the best candidate to, so I'm going to start with one of these. And the best candidate to start with is Baumgartner's principle for a couple of reasons. One is that it's already known to be consistent with the continuum equal to Aleph 3. Okay, so that's at least some indication that maybe there is some possibility there. And then I have to say it's also the earliest, right? So it was announced in 71, the proof was published in 73. The question of the higher analog was already asked in that paper in 1973. It's probably the earliest application of PFA so early that it predates PFA by almost a decade, right? Um, so that's another reason to try to start with that, right? Uh, and then there has been some work recently connecting it with notions of, of sparse, of, well, notions of fastness, let me say. Right? So this is recent work of Justin Moore, and he connected Baumgartner's principle with this thing which he called star, so that for any f of size aleph 2 consisting of countable, fun countable to 1 functions from omega 2 into omega 2, there is a function g which is almost always different from each of them, right? So there is this function g which differs from each of them on all but countably many ordinals. Okay? And he showed that star is necessary for Baumgartner's principle, at least if you get Baumgartner's principle in any of the imaginable scenarios, right? And then he also had some connection in the other direction. Okay, uh, and this star is a consequence of this of this sparseness axiom. Right? So this is uh, not a hard proposition. The separating axiom, uh, sorry, the sparseness axiom that I had before that's consistent from a weakly compact implies Justin Moore's star principle. Now, 
I guess in the same paper on star, Moore got Baumgartner's principle from star using CCC forcing, connecting it, basically connecting star to a general method of Tudorcevich to get Baumgartner's principle. So that looks great, right? We're done. <laughs> we have the consistency of star, and from that, by CCC forcing, we can get Baumgartner's principle. Unfortunately, the connection has a gap, so we're not quite done yet, and it's not clear if it can be closed. Uh, but I think this is a bit tentative, but I think you can still, in any case, force Baumgartner's principle from the sparseness axiom, not using a CCC posit, but using a posit close enough to CCC that it doesn't add new clubs, right? The same way that if you force with the CCC posit, every club in the extension uh, contains a club of V. So the same thing will be true for these posets, even though they're not CCC, they're close enough for that. It, that means that they preserve sparseness, right? Because sparseness was just a question, was just phrased based on clubs on aleph one, right? If you don't add new clubs on aleph one, sparseness is preserved. Um, so you can, I think tentatively, you can force Baumgartner's principle using from assuming SA using posets that preserve SA and also can be iterated and still preserve SA and you get Baumgartner's principle uh, from a weakly compact. Uh, it's a tentative theorem, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank, thank you. Great, so any questions? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, well, okay, if you just want to say. What about Aleph? <laughs> what about Aleph 3? <laughs> so, just uh, for the record, he asked what's about Aleph 3, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think things should work also for Aleph 3, but you would still have to use countable supports, right? I mean, the nice thing here at Aleph 2 is that you can somehow break the proof into stages where you have countably closed and countable supports, and then later, after that, something resembling CCC. Uh, if you move to Aleph 3, it's not like you'd be able to force using supports of size Aleph 1, because you would still need, the sparseness would stay the same, you would still need these and that involves adding new subsets of Aleph 1. So you would still need to use countable supports and countable approximations for whatever sparseness is. So you would need to use the two, not the two type side conditions for the iteration, but the three type side conditions. Uh, I think it should be possible, but it's substantially more complicated, so really I, I have no idea. But, but, but there is a good hope that it should be possible. Uh, any any more questions? Okay, so let's thank Ty again. <laughs>